was written on the currency. I was trying to oh. look for that. Oh, but okay. It, it's supposed to, you're always supposed to accept cash. I remember when I had my store. You cannot turn oh. down cash. And uh, and yet our state turns down. I went to the fr oh, yeah. franchise tax, or state board of equalization. Yeah. Or I had cash. And so I'm sorry, we can't accept the cash. I had to go buy money. Uh, uh, money know, orders. Money right? orders over at the market. Okay, and they yeah. wouldn't accept big enough of those. I had to go buy three, four money orders. Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the show today, we have uh, Stephen Greenhut, writer for uh, the Orange County Register and uh, the American Spectator, Cal Watchdog, and occasionally the Wall Street Journal, also the Western Director for the R Street Institute, author of Plunder, and um, Mike Murphy, who is an Uber driver and author of The Government, uh, the Greens and the forthcoming Amazon versus Macy and Uber versus Taxis. I think I got the name of that. That's all right. That's, that's right the concept. There, yeah. Um, John McCain uh, just accused Rand Paul of being a Putin operative. He did that on the floor of the Senate. Uh, the reason he did so is because uh, uh, Rand was uh, objecting to a NATO membership for uh, Montenegro. I don't even know where, I think that's probably part of the old Yugoslavian uh, uh, Federation. Anyway, they want to be in, they want to be in NATO and Rand Paul says not, not so fast, we're already defending, uh, you know, more countries than we have uh, money to do. And for that, John McCain said, you're a commie, you're a, you're a Putin operative, and uh, et cetera. Is, is John McCain losing it? <coughs> well, I'd say he's definitely the pot calling the kettle black, because if we look at uh, McCain's history, you know, we see a lot of stuff that I call big government. Anything to me that's big government, that's funded with money I didn't want to give it, to me is uh, smells of communism. So that's just my attitude towards that. And I think McCain's big, been a big proponent of big government in too many places. Um, the other interesting thing about that whole issue, the whole thing is that Rand Paul came back and said that, that uh, McCain's uh, uh, antics on the Senate floor were a good argument for term limits. I think we could probably all agree with that. <laughs> yeah, Mc, McCain is a, uh, a neoconservative <laughs> and uh, likes, uh, I don't think he's ever seen an intervention he doesn't uh, like. No. Uh, well, and yeah. he's definitely a bomb, believer. Bomb, bomb Iran during, yeah. during when he was running for president. He was yeah, we, we interviewed him at the Orange County Register editorial board. Yeah. And um, anyway, we'll, we'll just say after that, I uh, seriously considered voting for Obama. <laughs> <laughs> One of the biggest stories on MSNBC this week was uh, Rachel Maddow saying, hey, I've got a scoop. I've got Donald Trump's 2005 tax return and of course as soon as she made the announcement that they were going to go into his tax return uh, Trump uh, released it himself turns out that it was not a bad tax return he paid 25 percent rate that compares to uh, Bernie at 18 uh, percent Clinton at, or uh, Ber uh, Obama at about 13 percent and uh, Comcast which owns uh, MSNBC at 25 percent so you know nothing to be ashamed of uh, the, uh, you know, so t it all kind of, kind of turned into a big nothing. But what's really interesting to me is that the media has been trying to figure out who leaked the, uh, the uh, report in the first place. Everybody's trying to say, well, Donald did it. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Anybody care about? I found it really uninteresting. Um, <laughs> it seems, I have no idea who leaked it. <laughs> <laughs> who cares? It, yeah, it doesn't matter. I, I think he should have really, released his tax returns, but um, he didn't, so what are we going to do? It's well, we know human nature is they're going to pay as little taxes as they can pay within the law, and sometimes yeah, they fudge on that. that a little bit. Nothing you know, and that. it's kind of human nature, yeah. I have a question about, you, you do know a lot about pensions. You've been doing a lot of work. Oh, yeah, my, my second book was in, on pensions okay. called Plunder. Connecticut, state of Connecticut, uh, has a bill in the hopper that would require uh, state employees who leave the state, retire, leave the state, to uh, uh, turn over, I think it's 30% of their uh, pensions to the state, of, or have a reduction of, of pension benefits of 30%. Uh, is this a privileges and immunities clause issue, or, or do you think this is just grandstanding you know, I, by the politicians? There was a, it sounds like, I mean, I don't think legally that you can do that, because once you leave the state, you're no longer, I mean, the previous uh, legal cases, you're no longer uh, subject to the, the laws of that state. Um, I kind, In a way, I like the idea. Not that I, <laughs> <laughs> Anything to reduce the Hey, you, you may as well make them stay, make them suffer in retirement in, in Connecticut after they've, uh, but California, you know, retirees are heading out all throughout the, throughout the country, taking their, in many 
cases, massive pensions. But there was a case, I, it was, was it 20 years ago that uh, there was a ruling, uh, and I forget, I haven't looked up the, I haven't looked at the issue for a while, uh, that uh, uh, forbade uh, the state of California from taxing them um, as they as they leave, so I don't think you. Yeah, I, don't I don't think you I could think do a it. Deal's a deal, and you got to stand by it, whether it be Social Security or Medicare or what have you. Well, pensions are pensions are a different story in a way. I mean, I, I, everything about the the pension issue uh, is about uh, uh, trying to reform going forward. Okay, there hasn't been a single proposal in California, and there won't be, to take away earned benefits. Uh, even though those benefits had, had mostly since SB, uh, uh, SB 400 passed in 1999, which retroactively increased pensions by 50%. So in other words, I'm about to retire tomorrow and my pension has increased 50% going back to the day that I started. And that happened through, uh, so SB 400 at first applied it to California Highway Patrol with the, the full knowledge uh, that it would uh, that it would be expanded to from one one locality to the next, which is exactly what's happened. It was caused California's uh, pension crisis, which estimated unfunded liabilities estimated as high as a trillion dollars, uh, according to some estimates. Uh, so, there the effort, the whole issue in California and in about a dozen other states is called. It's about the California rule. A lot of other states follow that so-called rule. That just doesn't happen to be a rule. It's a series of court interpretations. Uh, bottom line is, although you can get your pensions increased retroactively uh, by the act of legislature, um, a union-owned legislature, you cannot give up any pension benefits going forward, even if you're made whole through the end of today. So I worked at a private company, uh, which I actually had a very small defined benefit pension, and we're talking about defined benefit pensions. Uh, which are the guaranteed based on a formula. So I had the pension. The company said we uh, can no longer afford that pension. So starting tomorrow, you will start earning at a lower amount, but you'll be made whole through the end of today. Uh, that new amount was zero in that case, but anyway. Uh, and public employees, it's not allowed. Once they are granted a pension benefit, uh, they, they, they get it, and their spouse gets it until uh, they go to the great union hall in the sky, which means... All the new pension reforms that the state passed, PEPRA in 2013 and the other modest reforms, um, only apply to new hires. So what does that mean? You get a new hire, he's not going to retire, she's not going to retire probably for 25, 30 years. So you're not going to get many savings uh, until far into the future. But the, the courts have consistently ruled uh, that, that you, you cannot, like in San Jose, 70-30 vote. Uh, it was 2012, uh, voters uh, approved a, a basically a rollback of pension benefits, and the court tossed it out and said, we can't, it's a violation of the California rule. So we're stuck in California paying these massive pensions. Uh, talk about the, the role of big money. The reason the pensions are so high is because the unions control the capital. So at some point, you know, at some point, the system's going to collapse. And I'm not, I'm not like you in the saying, well, you know, a deal's a deal. What kind of deal was it? It was a crummy deal with, uh, with an insider deal with the politicians elected by the unions cutting a deal with the unions and giving away a gift of public funds by retroactively increasing pensions. Now, I don't know what they did in Connecticut, but I'm sorry, at some point, it's all going to collapse. And right now, what we're seeing is a reduction in public services. We're seeing lots of local taxes, uh, Stockton, which uh, went bankrupt. Uh, increased taxes on its, its, its largely impoverished residents to pay for government employee pensions. And in a city where you could get lifetime, uh, lifetime medical for yourself and your spouse after working for the city as few as two months. I think there's another insidious underlying reasoning that has to be thought about. Why would you go work for something like the IRS and become nobody's friend? or the State Board of Equalization become nobody's friend, or be a lobbyist, or be a police chief keeping his mouth shut when he knows he'd like to speak out, but he's got a nice big pension, carrot, at the end, carrot on a stick kind of a thing to stay there for. These pensions are built in so that those jobs become appealing and people go do them, no matter how unpopular those jobs might be. And so state workers, in order for people to work for the state, it's got to 
be kind of easy, it's got to be secure, and it's got to have great benefits. Otherwise, you're not going to work for the state. Well, I mean, there are, uh, tw are 22,000 applicants for every firefighting opening mm -hmm. in California. The median uh, total compensation package is somewhere around $180,000. You know, they're highly sought after jobs. And um, you don't have to work very hard for the most no, part. No, I mean, you work in firefighting, you work four days on, and then you're off and for four two, days in two on. weeks. In two weeks. But yeah. there's an and extreme the danger on, factor. No, in there's, fire, there's not. Firefighting is a very low danger. In fact, it's um, very low on the. It, it's an occasionally, there's occasional danger, uh, but it's pretty low on the. Most of the time you're sitting around the firehouse. Well, I'd like to see those statistics. Waste. I understood it was well, the other way around. No, it's, actually nine, 90, no, it's not at all. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, it's not on the top dozen of dangerous professions. Uh, taxi drivers, roofers, loggers, fishermen. It's, uh, Farmers. Yeah, police also uh, not a high danger. It's occasionally high danger, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not an overall high if you look at the Bureau of Labor yeah. Statistics. The other thing, the police and firefighters, their unions often say, hey, the reason we get these huge pensions is we die soon after we retire. Sometimes they'll say three to five, three to seven years after they retire. I've, I've, they say that all the time. I've, I, I got from CalPERS, the California Public Employee Retirement System, I, I got their data on it and they have really good data. Uh, the longest living for uh, employee category of any type is a police officer <laughs> followed by a firefighter. They live to be in their low to mid 80s. Uh -huh. um, the women live a little longer than the men, which is uh, oh. so anyway. So it's it's so they they live longer than the rest of us. Uh, the danger level, if you look, just look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it's it's not that high on 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 the on the. You know, on average. Uh, yeah, it, it's just, it just isn't. And of course, you know, I, I'm not trying to downplay the fact that there are occasional dangers and some of those are very serious. And we have seen police officers and we see firefighters who die occasionally. And, and, and I'm, I'm not making light of that. I'm just pointing out that statistically, it's, it's, it's not as high as, uh, as, as they say. And people want those jobs, especially the firefighting jobs. In San Diego, they opened Qualcomm Stadium because there were so many applicants for a handful of jobs. So if it was such a, and, and if we believe in markets, uh, that suggests that the market's out of balance. And whatever dangers are in any job, uh, uh, you know, I'm a journalist, there aren't that many dangers in journalism and think tank work, but but the pricing gets figured in and, and everything. People, people make uh, determinations based on their sense of how dangerous it is. Now, unions always try to expand the sense of danger uh, that their members face, but that's just their way of, of, of bargaining. Um, we see there was a law firm that represented uh, just dozens, I think it was well over 100, maybe 200 police agencies in the state. And they, they, it's a now defunct law firm, but they posted on their website what they called the playbook. And it was about how to intimidate, essentially, you know, city councils into submission. And, and yeah. a lot of it is through, through, you know, expanding the sense of danger and what their, what their members have to go through. And then people buy it, and then they're willing to give away the store. After 9-11, after uh, we saw a lot of, I saw the, uh, you know, the Long Beach Fire Department, uh, I think it was the police department, uh, sending a letter referencing 9-11 and their salary negotiations. The Laguna Beach Fire Department plastered pictures of 9-11 on the side of uh, fire trucks while they were doing uh, negotiations. I agree 100%, yeah. but I want to add in from the private sector. You know, you take something like Uber and Lyft, and you have no retirement, no overtime, no uh, sick leave, none of the benefits that you would have with a job like being a fireman. And are we good? And, and another thing that's kind of uh, uh, interesting about the Uber situation is that these drivers are not getting all those benefits. So in order to get drivers, they put a bounty on us finding drivers for them. Well, well, so Uber drivers, yeah. they raise their, they pretend that they're making more money than they're really making so that they can get a driver to recruit so that they can win the bounty from the company. Now, what kind of job do you need to have a bounty to get somebody to hire on with it? When you're a fireman, they don't have to pay a well, bounty. Well, yeah, to get it's people called working. the market. But what, what are you suggesting be done about the Uber? The market will figure that out. That's right. And, and it will. I mean, I, I'm sorry, but I don't complain if somebody offers me a bonus to lure me uh, to take a job. I mean, that's... Well, well, speaking uh, of dangerous jobs, yeah, that's, right, it, it appears, uh, reading the, 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 the news headlines, that being a political operative is a dangerous job. 
Roger Stone, longtime political operative, was uh, a victim of a hit and run. He's claiming that it was uh, a possible assassination attempt, especially after he claimed uh, that he was uh, poisoned not uh, too many months ago. Uh, this is all part. He's Does it pay the, to be a friend of the Clintons? No, this is a friend of the Trumps. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Clinton's either. But anyway, uh, the, the, the point I'm making is with the circus that we have as part of the Trump administration, is there any credibility at all <coughs> to Roger Stone saying that because he was a victim of a hit and run, it may have been an assassination attempt? attempt? I'm a newspaper reporter. I, I, I don't know anything. You know, I, I, I have no idea. It's just you're just asking whether, whether what what's, he's alleging happened it may be true or not. How do you know? I have yeah. no and idea. Newspaper reporting might be just as dangerous. Uh, <laughs> believe me, it usually isn't. Not in this country, fortunately. <laughs> the uh, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department has, uh, in their wisdom, decided to spend three hundred thousand dollars for the purpose of switching the belt buckles on their deputies from uh, colored uh, silver to colored gold. Now keep in mind that the actual metal is brass, so they're only talking about changing the color of the, uh, of the buckle from silver to gold. $300,000, is that something that, actually, that makes any sense at all? Well, it makes sense in the context of a police bureaucracy. I mean, police bureaucracies are, are amazing. It's like any government agency, the kind of decisions they make, the kind of spending decisions that they make. I mean, $300,000, is a, a tiny portion of one uh, assistant to the assistant deputy's, uh, you know, uh, uh, retirement plan. But it's it's totally ludicrous. And if you read the Times article, the rationale by the uh, was it the, the sheriff who said it or one of the, the one of the top brass, yeah. haha, uh, was that um, it would help in, enhance the command presence of the deputies. So, so I they, guess they if you if, if he saunters up and his 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 belly is over a brass, a shiny brass object rather than a, a mat or whatever it was. Silver, yeah. Silver uh, colored brass object that apparently he'll have more command. But wouldn't presence. you like to be a belt buckle lobbyist? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like books for schools, you know. Wouldn't you like yeah. to be Macmillan? Have them change a little something in the history book to focus more on women or on black history. Now they've got to buy all new school books. Who benefits? We're follow the money. Well, speaking oh. of following the money, the... Uh, one of the, the most powerful lobbies in the state of California, and probably nationwide, is uh, the various teachers unions. And uh, California Senators Henry Stern and Kathleen uh, Galgiani have introduced a bill to eliminate state income tax for teachers. Why in the, re in the world, uh, what, what, what possible excuse can you come up for well, doing well, that? I mean, it's a, it's a horrendous idea that will spread you know, to every other politically favored public employee group. So it's a terrible idea. But the idea is uh, they're, they're having trouble uh, getting uh, school districts to be able to increase salaries to the degree that uh, uh, the teachers uh, would like them to raise salaries. There's, there's claims of a school, of a teacher shortage. Is, are there any, is there any validity to that at all? I think, there, I think it depends. I think in some districts, yeah, there probably is. Now, of course, there are all sorts of ways of dealing with that. You know, we could have, uh, you, well, I think a private school system would be, would be one of them. Uh, more charter schools uh, being able to, to, to pay uh, not based on seniority, uh, you know, not being able to last in first out of, of, of uh, layoffs and that sorts of, those union rules, if you got rid of those, you would be able to adjust salaries and, and, and have a more, a little bit more of a market influence in the, in the teaching profession. But w one of the funniest things from the, the article I read was the teachers union, um, they, they didn't have a comment on the bill yet. They were just, you know, reading up on it. Like, you know, can you imagine that they were <laughs> oh, yeah. like, I, I mean, like I don't know for sure, but. Came as a complete surprise. Right, complain is total so. surprise. I'm for, just on the my, record, my, my, my I'm for dismantling this, public education altogether. Oh, I really yeah. am for that. No, okay. That's, okay. Well, I mean, I, I've done this. I've had the debate. I've had a debate with a county uh, school superintendent. And uh, I was supposed to discuss uh, uh, choice, educational choice, and I argued it was a fun thought experiment to a group of teachers that yeah. we should shut down the public schools mm -hmm. and just let the private sector do it. And they were kind of aghast. It's, it's, it's easy to present as a thought experiment. But in reality, you know, you, you, teachers in a, in a free market system 
uh, you know, the very good ones would get get offered extremely large salaries. Now, right now, uh, the, like the the LA Times did a did an interesting series a few years ago um, about the rubber rooms where teachers are paid <laughs> not to teach. Right. And because uh, they can't be fired, but they can't they be, can't be fired. Can't be so the yeah, and John Stossel, he on his show, he did he had a he had a piece of paper with these little graphs showing what it's like to get fired in a New York. Uh, New York City school district, right? And it's just go, you go down and down and down. And the, the audience is laughing. And when you got to the down here, he drew, let lose four other pages. <laughs> so you can't get rid of them. You can't get rid of police either. And I could give endless examples, but which is probably the reason we have such a, we have a problem with uh, uh, communities concerned about police abuse. Well, the problem is that you can't get rid of the bad deputies. Uh, or the bad cops because of, because of the union protection. Same thing with teachers. You can't get rid of the bad ones. So maybe we could. How many years did it take after that horrific uh, molestation case in Los Angeles Unified to pass a, a law that would make it easier to get rid of really bad actors? It took a long time. Right. You get rid of public education, you got instantly good roads, instantly good bridges, instantly good dams, and all this kind of stuff because now you got the money finally. Now, number two, I can go online and I can get all I can eat programming videos to teach me any language from COBOL forward uh, on uh, for 99 bucks. And I can actually, and if I'm hiring, and they hire so many kids that aren't learning their stuff in school into the programming fields and things like that, there's so many avenues in the private sector that are cheaper, more efficient, and well, yeah, follow the learning Well, you've got Khan Academy and, and various other uh, online learning. Well, the, learning exactly. and, uh, the, real qu the real question, what you get to right away whenever you propose this idea, and again, I think it's best to propose it as a thought experiment because most people aren't even at charters yet, let alone dismantling <laughs> yeah. the system. And, uh, you know, I, but, you know, obviously uh, we, we buy our cars from Toyota and Honda. We don't buy Yugos and government assembled cars. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense. But, but it, you, you just can't really get there with people. But the problem they point out is the poor. That's the first thing you say. So the first thing I respond is uh, the poor are the ones who are terribly miseducated right now. Yeah, so, take, so the, a look, take a look at the quality of education that's going on in Watts, the quality of right. education that's going on in Compton, even the LAUSD. The quality of education. Oh, it's more awful. poverty in California and the other state in the United States. Last I heard. Well, yeah. So, so the poor, the 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 education system ill serves the poor right now. Yeah. Okay. And then second, 